right, welcome back to another week of CS125. So, today what we're going to do is we're going to finish up talking about polymorphism, and I promise this is the last time that we'll go through this, um, but I also promise that it is the last time that we'll go through this. So if you have questions about polymorphism, which is probably one of the more difficult conceptual topics that we've covered so far this semester, please ask them today, because on Friday we're going to go on. As a reminder, on Wednesday we will not have class, um, and my office hours will be canceled on Wednesday as well. Um, the, in the second, maybe half, 20 minutes, we'll see how we go of today's class, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about packaging uh, and about build systems, just so that you understand a little bit about how those parts of the Android Studio projects you guys have been working on actually work. Uh, this is something that will become more useful when you start working on your final project. We'll provide a lot of help at that point. It's not particularly exciting material, um, but I think it's worth covering for about the amount of time we'll spend on it today. Okay, so to review a little bit as we get started, is this going to, right, so remem remember that this is going to become important later. I just want to remind you that in Java, we organize all of our classes, all of our custom types that we create to model different types of information into this tree. So every class can extend at most one other class. That means that it has one link up the tree. If I don't explicitly extend something, then I extend object. And if you think about it, as typically what happens is that as I move down the tree, I add classes inherit the behavior of their parents, and then they add things to it. So for example, if I start up here at object, object we know has to string and hash code and equals, and then this character class might add the ability to store one character. Um, a digit might restrict that to be a numeric character, a letter might restrict that to be um, a certain type of, uh, you know, a letter character, and then th these restrict it further, right? So this maybe isn't a great example, but in a lot of cases, what we see is that we go down the tree, we get additional methods, we get additional um, state. So as we go down, we add state and behavior, or we might also override the state and behavior that we inherit. So lower classes can override two strings so that they can be printed in a useful way. But they usually add new fields to their parent classes and also add new methods. As we go up, we lose those new fields and behavior. So if we started down here, we might have a class that had added, either through inheritance or on its own class, several new fields. And as we go up, all those fields go away. By the time we get to object, object in Java provides to string equals and hash code, but it doesn't actually store anything. It's just a, a template for us to use for designing our lower classes. So the reason I'm pointing this out is that later in class, we'll talk about how this relates to how we use polymorphism in Java. As we go up the tree, we get more general. Every single class in Java can be considered an instance of type object because they all have object as a parent. So on some level, if I want to write a method that operates on every single type of Java object, I can do that. I take an object as a parameter to that method, and now you can call it on any Java object. The trade-off, though, is that when I do that, I can only use the methods that I know are guaranteed to exist on every single Java object. So far, we've talked about two string equals and hash code. So as long as you can write your method with just two string equals and hash code, you can have it work on all Java objects. As I go down the tree, I'm gaining uh, features. So these lower classes are adding state. They're adding new fields. They're adding new behaviors. They're adding uh, new methods that I can call. So as I go down, I have access to more interesting parts of those custom classes, but I can operate on fewer of them. So if I write, for example, a method that takes a letter as a parameter, it can now be passed a letter, a vowel, or a consonant, but it can't be passed a digit, a character, or an object. So as I go down, I lose generality, but I pick up uh, power, I pick up capability. As I go up, I lose capabilities, I lose those added features that the objects provide through inheritance, um, but I gain generality, so I can operate on more object types. Okay, we'll come back and review this later in class. But this is, this is sort of uh, 
the trade-off with polymorphism. So as I reminded you, you know, if I don't explicitly extend something, I extend object. Object is, um, you know, implicitly the parent of every single Java class. And there are a small number of, of fairly important methods that every single object inherits from capital O Java object. So those are to string. Oh, this is awkward. To string hash code and uh, equals. And those are the ones that we're going to focus on this semester. So every single Java object I can uh, guarantee is going to implement those methods. These are the three that we're going to use. We've already been talking a little bit about toString. You guys are having a chance to use equals on MP2, and we've done some homework based on equals. Um, and then hash code we'll come back to and talk about uh, later in the class when we talk about hash tables and maps. That's also a tremendously useful, um, useful method, even though it may not make sense right now. OK. And. Remember that typically we don't just use the default object implementations of these fields, we override them. So what that means is that I'm still gonna provide a field with the same method signature. So I'm gonna still provide a method with the same signature. But I'm gonna do my own thing. I'm gonna provide an implementation that's useful for my class. This is particularly true with toString. If you just try to print an object that doesn't support toString, you get this fairly meaningless um, you know, as useful as possible, but still not particularly helpful display from Java. If that class overrides toString, it can choose to provide much more detailed and useful information. So when I try to call a method on a Java object, this is one of the places where the Java type hierarchy gets used. And so this is how this works. Again, this is a little bit of review. So what Java, what the compiler will say is, does that class, let's say I'm trying to call a method called foo. Does the class provide a method called foo that's, um, that matches the signature that I'm trying to call? So I might be passing one int. So does the class provide a method called foo that takes a single int as a parameter? It also has to be public, or at least I have to be able to access it. Maybe I'm a subclass and it's marked as protected. Maybe I'm in the same package and it's marked as package private, but I have to be able to access that method. If it doesn't, if so, then I use that. If not, then what I do is I go to the parent class and I continue the search. But now, actually, sorry, so if the class has a method and I'm inside a function on that class, then I can also access private methods, obviously. But now I go to its parent and I start using the public and protected keyword. So if the parent has a method called foo that takes a single int that's either public or protected, that's what I use. And I continue this. If the parent doesn't have that method, then I go to the parent's parent. If the parent's parent doesn't have that method, I go to the parent's parent's parent until I get all the way to object. If I don't find it at that point, then that fails, and the compiler will generate an error saying that it couldn't find this method. So this is one of the places where that tree that we just saw gets used by the compiler to try to look up when you call a method, what method is it that you're talking about? And this is essentially how inheritance works, right? So when I inherit from another class, what that means is that I don't have to provide all of the methods that that class I'm inheriting from already implements. Because if I use one, I'll get the implementation that's provided by my parent by default. If I decide that the implementation that's provided by my parent isn't sufficient or isn't appropriate, then I can override it by providing my own method with the same uh, type, with the same method signature. So, you know, here's our kind of our silly example. So when what happens, you know, choo-choo is of type sweet old dog in this example. When I call to string, Java looks at sweet old dog and says, does it provide a method called to string that takes no arguments? The answer is no. Then it looks at old dog. Does old dog provide an argument, uh, a function named to string that takes no arguments? No. Then I look in dog. Then I look in pet. And finally, I get to animal, and I find a method called toString that takes no arguments. If I remove this, then I'm, it's still going to work because I'm going to go all the way up to object, and I'm still going to be able to resolve this method. Right, so I will still, this is one of the default methods provided by object. Let's provide a different one. We'll call this test, and we'll have it take a single int. 
So now, if, so now, first of all, what's going to happen is the compiler is going to complain right off the bat because it's going to say a method called test is not declared. So what did it do? It looked in sweet old dog and it didn't find a method called test that takes a single integer. And it repeated that search in dog, old dog, pet, and animal. And then it got all the way up to object and this particular search failed. So what do I need to do to fix this? Um, let's add a method called test that takes an int argument. And we'll just return zero or eight or something. So now this will work. If I put another method up here, let's return six here, you'll see that I'm still gonna get the same result because the search stops as soon as it finds a method with the appropriate signature. Now, if I change the type signature of the test implementation I'm providing in sweet old dog to not take any arguments, now it's gonna print six because it's looking for a function called test that takes a single int argument. And so here it's not found in this class, it's found in the parent. Questions about this? It's important to understand as before we go on. Okay, good. So we've talked a couple times about polymorphism, which is the idea that within the type hierarchy, a class can act as an instance of any of its parent classes. Polymorphous, multiple types or multiple shapes. The ability for a class to morph into more than one class. So every object is really an instance of two objects. So if I go back and look at this example, a sweet old dog can be considered, it can be passed to a method that takes as a parameter an old dog. It can also be passed to a, a method that takes as a parameter a pet or an animal or an object. It can morph into any of these objects um, as needed. This is, this is due to sort of automatic upcasting that Java will do because Java knows that at minimum, sweet old dog inherits all of the features of pet. So any features of pet that a method might be using, sweet old dog is going to inherit and maybe it overrides some of them, but if so, that's okay. Right? So I can still, any method that's defined on pet, I'm guaranteed to be able to call on a sweet old dog because a sweet old dog can't get rid of that method. It can modify how it works but it can't remove it, so it's safe to call. All right, so this is our, our first example of something called subtype polymorphism, and this is one of the three types of polymorphism in Java. And this, is, this happens because every Java object is an instance of at least two different classes itself, and object and potentially a lot more if it's part of a much deeper hierarchy. So Java will do this automatic upcasting for me um, so I can pass both of these to this method that takes an object. What happens when the program runs is that um, ziz, which is an instance of a pet, the compiler says, can that pet be cast to an object? It says, does it inherit from object? Is it an object or does it inherit from object? In this case, the answer is, is it an object? No. Does it inherit from object? Yes. Therefore, it can morph into an object and be safely passed to print anything. The same thing for uh, the dog here. All right, so we saw this last time. I'm not going to dwell on it further. But Java also always knows what the actual type of an object is. So just because I've upcast the object to a different type, that object is still whatever it was created to be initially using the new keyword. So for example, here what I'm doing is on line nine, I'm creating a new instance of the dog class. On line 10, I'm upcasting Choo Choo to be a object. And if I print out choo choo as object, Java will still use the two string method provided by the dog class. So even though this is, uh, choo choo is masquerading or has morphed into an object, the search for a method called to string that matches the, to the parameters that are being requested still starts in the dog class. So choo choo doesn't become an object, just become a, a, because I cast him to an object on line 10, he's still the dog, Java knows that, and the right method gets called. All right, so we talked about downcasting last time. Th there's, a, there's a way, so there are, there are places in your code, um, and we'll particularly see this once we start talking about interfaces, um, I think next week, where you may need to test whether an object is of a particular type. This is particularly important when you're trying to downcast something. 
So remember, I can take an, I can take an object that has been upcast and downcast it as long as the, it's, the downcast is sort of on the way to where the object originally started. So if I take, yeah, maybe I should talk about this again. So here, if I take Choo Choo and, and upcast him to a dog on line nine, then it's safe on line 11 to downcast Choo Choo to a pet. This is okay, because Choo Choo is actually a dog. So when you do a downcast, Java says, is the cast that you're trying to downcast to, is it, is it the class that the object actually is, or is it one of its parents? If so, that succeeds. If not, it fails. Because this whole time, Choo Choo has always been a dog. And if I tried to downcast Choo Choo to a sweet old dog, then it's possible there are features that he doesn't have that a sweet old dog needs to have. But this is okay, because I know that Choo Choo um, is actually a dog, and pet is dog's parent class. So this is an okay downcast. Questions about this? Again, you know, th at this point in your life as a Java programmer, it is important at some level to be able to think about this hierarchy, right? To be able to think about what's happening when I go up the tree looking for things, like a method with the proper signature, when I cast things up the tree, and when I cast them down the tree, and the rules that apply. This is something that will definitely be on quizzes uh, in the next few weeks. Okay. If I want to know what an object actually is, or whether it's an instance of a particular type, Java provides an operator called instance of. So I can use this to take an object and to test whether or not it's an instance of the particular type. Now notice that instance of will return true if the object is that type or descends from that type. So for example, here I've created on line six um, a dog. I've upcast that to a pet called Choo Choo, and then I've created a cat. I've upcast that to a pet a variable called Ziz. Choo Choo instance of dog will be true. Choo Choo is actually a dog. That's what's on the right side of the new keyword. Choo Choo instance of pet, that will also be true. Choo Choo inherits from pet because the dog class extends pet. If I did Choo Choo instance of object, that's always true, except if Choo Choo is a primitive type, like an int or a bool, uh, boolean. But if I have any object, it's always an instance of object. Choo Choo instance of cat is going to be false because Choo Choo is an actually a dog. Dog extends pet. But if I walk up the tree, do I find cat on my way there? No. So I can't cast Choo Choo to a cat. So essentially, instance of returns true whenever I can cast an object to that type. So in this case, I can cast Choo Choo to a dog because Choo Choo is actually a dog. I can cast Choo Choo to a pet because Choo Choo is a dog which extends pet. I can't cast Choo Choo to a cat because Choo Choo, um, because cat is off a different branch of, of the pet tree. So if I go, if I walk up the tree, do I find cat on my way to object? No. I start with dog, I get to pet, I get to object. Um, cat may have features that, that Choo Choo doesn't have, so I can't cast them to a cat. So again, I'll, I'll print, print this, and then down here I'll say, uh, I'll try doing cat, choo-choo, sorry, cat, choo-choo as cat is equal to, let me try casting choo-choo to a cat. You're going to see dog cannot be cast to cat. All the animals, all the pets in the world are happy about that. Um, and, and again, here's why. So let's, let's imagine that um, I have cat, and what's something that a cat might have? Um, let's see, and... Uh, number, let's call this lives remaining. Set that to nine. So here's an example now where the cat class has a field that dogs don't. Dogs only have one life, apparently. Uh, cats have nine. And so if I try to cast Choo Choo to a cat, you know, I, when I ran the Choo Choo, cons the dog constructor, it didn't, I didn't set up the object appropriately to be able to do this cast. So this is why this doesn't work. Questions about this? Before we go on. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so, so the question is, is there a difference, if I understand it correctly, let me make sure I do. So is there a difference between this and this? Is that the question? Yeah, there is. So let's, let's talk about what it is. Um, 
let me declare a method called, um, and this just have this return true. So now if I, hold on, let me get rid of this. This is gonna fail. It's a great question. It actually gets at the heart of what we're gonna talk about in just a second. So if I try to call choo-choo dot is dog, this is gonna fail. Why? Choo-choo's a dog, so he provides this method. I just added it. And this is a, this is a, this is a great question, and this is a great example. It's gonna be a good segue to what we're doing next. Um, why is it angry now? This is different. Oh, sorry. Angry about the, the cast. Okay. So this works. So if I don't cast choo choo to a pet, I can call the dog, the is dog method. Once I cast choo choo to a pet, I can't. So what's actually happening here on line 12? This is important to understand. The right side of line 12 is creating a dog, but the left side is upcasting dog to a pet. Once I upcast dog to pet, I can't use any of the methods that the dog class added to the pet class. I can only use methods that are provided by the pet class. Let's see why this is. Because, for example, um, all right, let's create a, a method called is pet. Let's have this return true. These are silly methods, obviously. So I can call is pet, and I can actually call this on ziz as well. I'm just gonna get rid of these. And I'll print this one out. Yeah. So if, once I upcast to a pet, I lose the ability to call dog and cat specific methods. So if I added, you know, so for example, here, I also can't access Ziz's lives remaining. Because it's not provided by pet. Okay, so, let me go forward. Um, okay, so we've seen this, we've seen this. All right, sorry, I wanted to skip that because this is a great segue to here. So what is this for? So essentially, the, 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 one of the reasons we talk about polymorphism, even though this isn't something that you guys are gonna use very much, um, necessarily on MPs, we do have some homework problems about it, obviously, but this really gets at the point and the purpose behind Java's entire type hierarchy. So descendant classes can, you know, this is hopefully, this is inheritance. Descendant classes can override ancestor behavior um, they can also add their own things, but they retain all of the ancestor properties. Polymorphism allows us to, to make methods that operate on many types of objects while guaranteeing that we have access to certain methods or classes, right? Even ones that you haven't created. So for example, let's go back to this, this pet example. Let's say and actually, this is kind of similar to uh, the, one of the homework problems you guys are working on right now. So let's imagine that I have a pet, and let's create a pet constructor that takes a string type, and let's use that to set the type of this pet. Type is equal to set type. We'll create a string type. I'm not worried too much about access modifiers right now, okay? So now my dog class needs to also provide a constructor that initializes the, uh, its parent properly, so it's a dog, use lowercase here. And my cat class is also gonna have to do this. All right, so now it's complaining about is pet. Let's get rid of this. So now I've created two, and actually let's, let's let these be dogs. Dog, cat. And now let's add a method here that takes a pet, and let's just 
print the pets type. And public static void. Okay, good. And let's call it get type on choo choo. Okay, good. So, so what have I done here? So I've set up a new constructor for my pet class. I'm essentially telling uh, any, all of my descendants that if you want to descend from pet, you have to call a constructor and tell me what type of pet you are. So imagine that I, I create this package here. And I've got um, a bunch of methods that I've put in here, and this is kind of a silly example, but that operate on pets. So let's say you take my class and you're like, you know what, there's a lot of other pets in the world, right? I mean, dogs, cats are not the only pets out there. What about who has a pet that's not a dog or a cat? Anybody? What is it? A lizard. Okay, so let's, let's make a lizard class. I like lizards. Um, all right, so let's say someone comes along and they say, I want to add a lizard class to this particular uh, system. They're going to have to create a constructor that calls the parent class, right? Uh, extends. There we go. But now, I'm going to create a new lizard. Maybe that doesn't seem so cool, but, but here's what happened. Because your function only relies on features that are provided by pet, any class that extends pet can be passed to get type. So if you write a method that's useful, that only operates on the common information that we store about pets, and that might include name and age and location and things like that, right? If your class, if your method only operates on things that every pet has, even random new pets that someone who takes your code and extends it creates will still work. So you can start writing code that, that works with code that people are going to write in the future using your package. And again, this will be, this will be uh, much more important and interesting when we talk about interfaces, which are similar to inheritance, but more flexible. The idea is that now your methods that work on pet work on any subtype of pet. Anybody who creates new pets, um, you know, if, if somebody takes your package and decides to add a bunch of new pets that are appropriate to their, you know, application, your methods still work. And what we're actually kind of pointing out here is that there's a, there's a trade-off here. And that trade-off, and this is so common in computer science, right? And you guys will find this going forward. Um, particularly once we start to talk about algorithms in the you know, last third of the class, when you guys go on to take 126 and 225. Now, a lot of being a sophisticated computer scientist comes down to making trade-offs between things. And here's a classic one. So, the, the more, the so in general, when you write a method and you're thinking about what type it should accept, what type of object it, it could accept, you're faced with this uh, trade-off. So the higher you go on the object hierarchy, the more different types of objects can be passed to your method. But, so that's the pro. The con is that you get to make fewer assumptions about those objects. So for example, if you need something that's provided by string, you can't have your method take an object as a parameter because not every object's gonna have that, that particular capability. Before, if we needed some field that was provided by cat, we can't write a method that takes a pet because it can't rely on every pet having that feature. However, if we write a method that only needs information that's stored on the pet object, now it can take any type of pet, including cats, dogs, lizards, you know, ferrets, whatever. As you go low, so, so that's, the, that's why you want to, you know, try to make your methods as general as possible. As you go down, is you write methods, so instead of writing a method on pet, if we wrote a method on dog, now I have some dog-specific information that I can start to use in my method. So for example, if I wrote a method that uh, acted on cat, now I can see how many lives the cat has. So if my cat method, if my, pet, if my method needs information about how many lives the cat has, then I can't get it to work on pet because not every pet has that feature, essentially. So higher on the object hierarchy, more general, but fewer features. 
in, in, the, in the limit, if you write a method that can take an object as a parameter, you can use two string equals and hash code. That's it. You can't use anything else. It turns out we can actually write a lot of surprisingly useful methods using only those features, and that's one of the reasons that in Java every object has them. But there's a bunch of methods that we can't write. So, but if I can, if your method will work with just those capabilities, great. Then have it accept an object. And now you've written a method that can work on any Java object. As you go down the object hierarchy, you pick up capabilities that are specific to the object classes that you're using. But fewer and fewer objects will be able to be passed to your method. Does that make sense? Questions about this? Again, if I write this fully, so if I, uh, let me go back and, let's go back and look at this example. So here, if I could write this method down here to work on object, it would, I could pass anything to it. Any Java object, including ones that haven't even been created yet. If I have it work on pet, then I can pass any pet to it, including types of pets that haven't been created. If it only works on cat, now I'm starting to get more limited. So now dogs can't be passed to it. Now lizards can't be passed to it. If I extended cat, maybe I have feral cats, wild cats, small cats, big cats, cats that bite, cats that don't bite. I don't know. You have different subtypes of cat. All of those can be passed to this method. But I can't pass a dog. I can't pass an object. I can't pass a string. So that's, that's the trade-off. All right, questions about polymorphism before we stop. Uh, we have a series of homework problems, I think, starting today or tomorrow, where we're going to give you guys practice working with this concept. Um, again, this is, this is slippery. It's, it's confusing. Um, but it is a central feature of Java that is important to understand that has impacts about how you build systems and is something that we're going to see um, in a different way when we talk about interfaces um, next week. There were a couple of other questions that I asked before that I didn't get to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So there are languages, for example, where, I can, where a class can have multiple parents, right? And so now the idea of finding which method to use is more complicated. Yeah. So the question was, does polymorphism work differently uh, in other languages? The concept itself is stable across languages. But lang the, the way that languages implement um, types is different. So, for example, there are languages where not every object, so in, in Java, every object is part of a tree that's rooted at object. There are other languages that have multiple trees with different types of objects. So if you create a new object, it doesn't have to inherit from anything. It can start over from scratch. And so there, you know, polymorphism works differently. Right? But the concept itself is common to um, many different languages that use this type of hierarchical types. It's one of the reasons to set up your objects in a hierarchy in the first place. Great question. David, you had a question before. Yeah, so let's, let's, so the question was, if I upcast something, um, when can I uh, access the original methods? Okay. So, so here's an example. And actually, hold on. Let's let's use a different. Um, let's use something different here. Let me add a method to sweet old dog. Well, let's let's add this to. Why don't we add it to dog? I'm going to add a method called. Again, this is just a dummy method, just to show you guys how this works. Okay. So now, let's try to call choo choo dot test. What do you think is going to happen? So choo choo, what type of object is choo choo? No. What's on the right side of the new keyword? Sweet old dog. Choo choo is a sweet old dog. Now, choo choo is, has morphed into an object here because I've upcast him to an object. So can I call the test method? No. Okay. What about. Now let's try this. Let's say um, sweet old dog 
sweet choo choo is equal to sweet old dog choo choo. Will this work? Well, if I could type. Yeah. What happened here? So I created an object of type sweet old dog and I upcast it to an hopital O object. And then here I downcast it back to a sweet old dog. So now that it's a sweet old dog, I can call the test method again because the test method is implemented in the dog class. What about if I do this? Will this work? No. Because now, so pet is the parent of dog. Dog is where test is implemented. So pet is the parent of dog, meaning that if I downcast this back to a pet, I can do that. But pet still doesn't have this method called test. What about if I use old dog? Will this work? Yeah. Now I'm below the class where test is defined. So now I've gotten back down to here, which it sends dog, which means I can use that method again. What about one more here? What about if I do dog? Will that work? Yeah. Because now I've downcast it right to the type of object that implements dog. Here's the thing to keep in mind. Choo Choo was always able to run this test method. The test method never went away. But by upcasting to a higher object class, what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm not going to use that method. So for example, if I upcast to an object, it means I can now pass to, to, to any function that takes an object, but not every object implements this test method. And so therefore, I can't use it on every object and I can't call it on uh, Choo Choo when he's morphed into an object. David, does that help? Well, once I downcast it to the point where the test method becomes visible again, then I can use it. So here, for example, if I downcast to pet, I can't use it because pet, pet doesn't provide test yet. Once I get to dog, then it becomes, then it becomes visible again. And anything lower than dog is also okay. That's correct. Yes. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's what I'm going to use it as. Right? So if I use Choo Choo as an object, I can only use methods that every other object has. If I use Choo Choo as a old dog, I can use methods that every other old dog has. Every other old dog has a test method because it's provided by dog class. Great question. This is, I mean, this is probably an example I would come back to when you're confused. Because this type of thing where you create like an artificially tall hierarchy and play around with kind of like where we are and what I can cast to. Um, so for example, you, you, you can also, um, you can also practice with, with casting here. So this is, all, this is going to work, but if I cast down to a sweet old dog, this is now not going to work. Because I'm trying to cast past where the object is in the hierarchy. Other questions? I'd rather stop here and talk about this for 10 minutes than, than race through build systems. I will, because you, know, you guys might as well see it. But yeah, in the back. Yeah, so in that, case, it's, in that case, it's upcasted automatic, right? So in that case, what's that? Yeah, so, okay, so this, this, is a, let, let me, this is a great question. All right, good. Let's do this example. So let's say I'm creating an old dog named Choo Choo. 
And now I'm going to place this by choo, choo So this is going to work. Now let's say I create a public method called um, object that takes an object. Now let's try uh, typing this. Okay, now if I try to pass choo choo to print object, this will not work. So I can call choo choo.test here because what I have is a variable of type old dog. Old dog has a test method. When I pass choo choo to this um, function that takes an object as an argument, Chuchu loses that capability, and now I can only use methods that I know that every other object is going to have. So I can call um, hash code. That'll work. You guys don't understand what that is yet, but we'll get there. Um, I can call hash code. I can call to string. Also works. They can't call the test. Does that make sense? So here I've got the same object. On line 21, I'm able to call a test method because I'm considering that object at that point to be an old dog. When I pass it to print object, print object's argument is a capital object. And so within the print object method, I can only use, I can only call methods on that argument that I know that every single object is going to, to implement. This is something the compiler will check for. So for example, if I try to call, uh, this test or something, I get a compiler error because the compiler knows, hey, I tried to look up this method called test. I started an object. I didn't find it. Does that help? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Great. Okay. Sorry. I get it. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's this fantastic question. Okay. So now the question is, yeah, where's my cut and paste? Can I still call, is this the question? Yeah, great question. Okay, let's, let's, let's try it and see what happens. Still works. So the question is, does print object somehow change choo choo into an object? No. Within print object, the argument is a capital O object. But choo choo is still an old dog. Yeah, so even after that finishes running, I still have, uh, an old dog variable that I can call that method. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, great question. So, yeah, okay, so, so the question is here, I'm, I'm able to call this toString method because it's provided by all objects, but I'm still getting the implementation that's provided by old dog. <laughs> exactly, right. So the cast determines the visibility of the methods. It doesn't determine the implementation. And this is actually really important because I want the object-specific behavior here that I get from toString, right? I don't want to give that, I don't want to give that up. Right. I want Java to run the two-string method, you know, that's provided by old dog because that's probably more useful than the one that's provided by capital O object. But the question here is that when I, when I upcast the argument in print object, that means that I can't call methods that aren't provided by object, but it doesn't mean that I get the implementations that are provided by object. If the class overrides the object to string implementation, that's still the one I'm going to run. This is a uh, desirable behavior, I would argue, right? Because I want, you know, the idea behind to string is that you're supposed to override that so you can print off information about your class that's useful. Object doesn't know about that. But yeah, so the cast determines the visibility of the methods. It doesn't change the implementations, assuming they're overridden in a lower class. Yeah. So, so here, here's maybe a way to think about it. When I call argument.toString, the first thing Java says is, is this method defined on object or one of its parents? And the answer is yes, right? Because object provides toString. 
when it starts looking for which implementation to use, it starts with old doc and works up. Yeah, so it checks for visibility. Does every object have this method? If the case is yes, I'm good. And then when it looks for the implementation, it still starts at, at uh, old dog. And that's because, as we pointed out in the past, Java still knows what kind of object this is, right? It hasn't forgotten that this is actually an old dog, just because I cast it to an object in order to pass it to this method. Great question. There's another question over here. Yeah. So the question is, if I lose functionality by upcasting, why would I want to do that? Is that a fair? So, so the, yeah, great question. Let me go back to the trade-off here. The, the trade-off is because I can now support more types of object. So let me give you an example. And this is something that, um, this, is, this, is some, this is actually true in Java. So Java has certain, um, general purpose classes, for example, storing a collection of different types of object, right? So I have like a container. It's almost like an array, but it's more flexible. And we'll talk about these a little bit later. I can put any type of Java object into that container, and I can take them out as well. All that relies on is the fact that I can call equals. Because, for example, if I'm looking, for, let's say I have a bunch of objects and I'm looking for one of them, all I do is I go through and I compare whether or not dot equals is equal to whatever was passed, right? Now I have, so essentially I implement something that's kind of like an array, but also the size can change. This is something that's called an array list. But I can store any type of Java object in that array list because the only thing I need is equals. The whole implementation is only predicated on having an equals method. If I implemented that on a lower class, I wouldn't be able to store objects that didn't inherit from that class in it. But because I, inherit, I implemented on object, you can literally store that class to store a list of any type of Java object. Yeah, so you get this generality of it. Yeah. So is the question, how would I prevent comparing objects of different types to each other? Yeah, we'll come back and talk about that. Yeah, Java has, Java has a system for this. Um, in general, when you implement equals, you can check to make sure that the object is of the right type, and if it's not, you can return false, right? So for example, a dog and a cat aren't equal to each other, ever. It doesn't matter what's inside the object. Um, but there's, Java has a better solution for this that we'll talk about later. It's called generics. These are great questions. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, okay, I think we did well on time today, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the part on build systems again. Awesome, I am not looking forward to that, clearly. Um, so, just a few quick announcements. So, no lecture on Wednesday. Um, please don't show up here, I won't be here. Um, I mean, I guess you can still show up, I can't stop you. The other room will be available. Um, I'm gonna cancel my office hours this afternoon. I have some work to do preparing the lab, but good luck. Uh, the MB2 early deadline is today at five. Um, I will see you guys on Friday, have a great week.